with the peace of the Lord. No, no. I checked. I came down in the airport at 7 o'clock p.m. 7 p.m. And it's, let's go to the church at 7 p.m. in the airport. I just realized I'm very Christian. So I have to go at 7 o'clock. So I don't have time to take a shower. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to greet anyone here. <laughs> and they even asked me, do you have a message prepared? That's how it is, right? But that's good, right? Is everything all right? We're going to open our Bibles. The letter to Hebrews. Hebrews 11. We're going to read just the first verse. Hebrews 11. First verse. Amen. Has everybody opened? It's out there as, as well, all right. But we don't like to do the projection because people get used and then get lazy, then they'll open the Bible. It's an exercise to open the Bible. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This letter to Hebrews was written about the year 65. Nobody knows who wrote it. And it's part of the fact that a few there are a few signs that it was written by Paul. And why is that? Because the writer of the letter to Hebrews seems to be a, a, a person that understands deeply the Old Testament. And he seems to know very well the entire, the entire the traditions, everything that was part of the Levitic, Levitical service and the law he knew it very well that's why people say that it is Paul because Paul was trained from his adolescence thank you he was prepared from his adolescence to be a rabbi and the rabbis they had In order to lead the temple, they need to know the law very well and the traditions. That's why it is said and spoken about this. But there is nothing that would prove that the letter had been written by Paul. But what is important, the observation of this text of the letter, because look, let's see something that you don't need to have revelation or to understand. If you pick up the story, the history, in the year 65, the year 65 is the year of the worst terror of the persecution to Christians. Why is that? Because the emperor was Nero. Nero was the emperor at this time. And he was an individual, a terrible individual. Uh, completely crazy person. He was an emperor, he had, had all the powers, and he was crazy, completely crazy. So this moment here is the highest point of the persecution, of the great persecution. He would meet, they would meet, the Christians would meet in the, the cemeteries, in the most inaccessible places in order to 
run away from the wrath of the persecution of the empire. So he was placing here something. In this moment of the church, he was approaching the faith because the church, the church of that time, it was, it arose from a message that was insane. Why, what was the message? Jesus, who died on the cross, he resurrected, but no one, no one has, has seen it. Only the ones who saw it were the ones who lived with him all the way to his death, but no one else has seen it. But, so how could they believe on something, a fact that they had to believe in what uh, the disciples were telling them? So in how this faith was able to reach thousands of thousands of people in such a short time. The first message that Peter delivered, 3,000 become uh, converts. And on the second message, 5,000. And, and the two messages that Peter delivers, a church who was a small church, now is an uh, 8,000 member church. What is the secret? What is this invisible thing that happened to these people that caused them to transform in a way that was so fast through a faith that would lead them to die on the arenas, glorifying the Lord and praising the Lord in the most terrible moments of their lives and of that terrible sacrifice. So the author, he writes to the Hebrews because the letter to the Hebrews because there was as letters geared towards the Jews who had been converted and they have been persecuted and maybe were being more persecuted than the Gentiles that came afterwards with the appearance of Paul. So they were all massacred and they were all convert Jews. So the letter was geared towards them. So what did the letter say? It says that the, the faith is the firm foundation of the things that we hope for and the proof of the things that you do not see. So why is it, how, how, why is this statement made here? So let's go back to history. And what does the history say? What was the religion that dominated the world at that time? It was not the Judaism. Judaism was a religion that was more geared towards Israel, predominantly inside of Israel. But the religion that was more prominent in the world was the religion was, was paganism. Why is that? Because the Roman Empire it goes and it, it takes a hold of the Greek because the empire that precedes the Roman Empire was the Greco-Macedonian Empire. The Greco-Macedonian Empire, what Alexander Alexander did. He was raised, was risen by a philosopher. He, Alexander was a philosopher. So what bring was to be a philosopher. So he gave a great emphasis to the philosophy and to the appearance of what was called the pagan services. What was a pagan service? It was uh, a service to uh, an image or sometimes you would pick up the illustration of the sun, and we would decide that the sun was God. So then you would have a service to the sun. You would uh, offer a service to an entity that would be called uh, the entity of love and something else. And so then they would create. So what a religion that was polytheist, that was uh, that would offer uh, that had many gods. So they adored the things that they seen. So they were completely materialistic. So the faith of these people was a mystic, mystic faith. It was they were a religious people that was involved in this. So what did the gospel bring? So the gospel brings a faith that was completely different than what was prevalent in the world. So what does he say here? The faith is a firm foundation of the things that we hope for and the proof of what you cannot see. So this would be a mystery. So what would faith be? The faith would be a mystery. So then how can you be able to have faith? So it, would, it was a, a supernatural 
operation. So that's what he was saying. Faith is an operation of the Holy Spirit. There's no faith without the operation of the Holy Spirit. So now you're going to pick up something that was very interesting to approach with you. So last month, the Sunday schools, they spoke a lot about it, about the religious reformation. It had a great importance for the church. And I was having a conversation with the pastors from the last preparation of the seminar. I was selling, saying the following. Not even Luther identified what he had done, realized he had done. Because, in fact, Luther, he didn't want to leave the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform the church. He didn't want to leave. He was called a reformer. Not only him, but there were before him the pre-reformers, John Hus, a hundred years before, Avaraora, Chaldeans, all those people that were trying, they attempted to make a reform of what was the structure of the church of their time. So when Luther, he takes the opportunity that the church, the, the Bible had been uh, being printed to Latin because with the appearance of the uh, the, the press machine and the, uh, from Gutenberg that made things easy easier so when he translate the Bible from the Latin to German what did he do? He didn't even understand what he had done he opened up the word so when, so when he opened up the word what happened when he opened the word? That was the parable of the hidden treasure. When he opened up the word, everybody began to read the word. What was forbidden? The church, church of the time forbade and throughout the period of the Middle Age, the, the period called the Dark Age of a thousand years, the Christians could not read the Bible because it could not be interpreted other than through the priest. So when the Bible was opened, what happened? What happened? What the word itself says. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. So when the word was opened up, there was a change in the sense of understanding of what faith was. So faith began to, to have a different meaning. So so the basic text that Luther uses in the religious reformation, which is the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8, he says, by grace you are saved through faith, and it doesn't come from you, it's a gift from God. So when he states this, he's once again placing faith in a situation in which faith is linked to grace. So faith is an operation of grace, which was different what the church of the time preached was completely opposite. The church at, uh, of the time preached salvation through works because at that moment the church would sell the indox in order for you to be free from your sins for an established period of time. Depending on the amount of money you, you gave to the church, you would be free from your sin for, for, for a while. There were people that preached, Tetzel said, Tetzel, in the time of Luther, he said, said the following. He said that when you give your offering, when the coins fall in, into the box of the church, lives were delivered from the purgatory. So this was a deviation from faith. And the faith at this time was not a faith of the primitive, primitive, primitive church. It, this faith had suffered a process of distortion that was violent and complete deviation from what the Bible says. So when the Bible was opened, what happened to the word? It brought the expression of the word showing that faith was something completely different than this. So why am I saying this to you? For the following reason. Because we need to be careful. Because what the Holy Spirit used with Luther, which was to rescue faith 
Faith comes from God. Faith does not come from, from something that you, an expression that comes from man. You are not able to achieve this in a rational way. And that's what he did here. But why do we preach this today? Because the fact can repeat itself again today. Why this fact can, re this fact can repeat itself today? Because when we base our faith, when we base, base our faith on an act, material act, we are running the risk of committing the same mistake of what happened in the period of post primitive church, the period in which the emperors enter and take hold of the, the, of the church. So what happens? How does it happen? So the emperors, one Constantine, on the edit of a Milan, when he stops the persecution to the Christians, Constantine, around the 300 years after Christ. And so what happened with the Christians? They thought that Constantine had been converted. Not true. Constantine, on his death, he demanded a pagan service to be made to God's son. He never converted. So why he stopped the persecution to the Christians? Because he was losing. The empire was losing ground on the Asian and that whole region. And Christianity was taking a hold of that region. So he wanted to please the Christians. So it was a prophetic factor that led the church astray from the path. So when the church thought that Constantine had, had converted, so what did he do? He introduces paganism inside of the church. Why is that? Because he was pagan. He believed in what was material and what was physical. Faith had to be something visible. So he had his own pagan gods. He brought the pagan structure and put inside of the church. He he brought the people that was known Christian, important people of uh, the history of the church and turned them into saints and idols like the paganism. That's what he did. So when the emperor that replaced him, Theodosius, was much smarter than him. He did not even stop the, the persecution, but decreed Christianity as an official, official religion of the Roman Empire. So the faith stopped existing. It became something material. So when the Bibles opened up, it turns around because of the word. And so now, what's the problem today? What can happen? That we can make the same mistake that they made in the past. Because the enemy is very smart. It's cunning. So, in what way? So, when I pick this up, when I pick this up and, and tell you this, that this, I anointed this flower, this. So, whoever comes here and touches for 30 seconds the leaf of this flower, receive their blessing. This is the same thing, that the same deviation that happened with the church of that time. So your faith is now on the leaf of the plant. Because somebody said that he anointed that leaf. So you criticize. No, I'm not criticizing anyone. I'm just calling you the, uh, the attention to what is biblical. Faith is not something material. It's, some, it's not something physical. It's, faith is not something that you can see. Faith is a mystery. It's an operation of God in your life in a deep way, in an incredible way. It's an operation of the Holy Spirit. So when you, and I put a glass of water and I ask you to drink this glass of water like if it was something important for you, it is a deviation. Why is that? Because when you use something that is physical, in order for your faith to be established in this, and that's not how it is. So then you say this, does Jesus cure? Of course Jesus cures, but in what way did he cure? Always with an objective. The objective of the healing was was to reach you in a supreme work and the work that is, was most important of the entire project of God which is the redemptive work of God so the physical healing the physical the matter we live in a period 
our life is temp temporal. temporal. So man lives in a, a, a time of man. So the creative work has a period, a determined period. It starts and it ends. But redemptive work is eternal. So the entire project of God is in the redemptive work. So he heals you. He can heal you. But when he heals you, is the great objective of God, or maybe in the life of someone that is around you, is to reach you on that person or that person to have eternal life. What you receive, the blessing they receive physically. That's why people are lost because they receive the blessing and then they go away. The same thing of the ten leopard. Only one returned. Jesus said to the one who returned, "Go, your faith has saved you." That's what we need to understand at this moment that faith can be deviate can deviate from what God thought but why do we need to give so much emphasis to faith because Jesus said that when he returned would he find faith on earth so the great project of uh, project of the enemy is to destroy faith that's it so when you see the gospel, when you are exposed, when you see the gospel being exposed, you become sad. People say, oh, not only Maranatha is saved. Oh, no, of course not. There are saved Christians, saved the God in many places. It would be an absurd to say, crazy things to say something like that. But sometimes you see things that create a difficulty for the preaching of the gospel. So it's necessary. Of course it's necessary. We need to observe something. The battle exists. The trial exists. The primitive church fought. The primitive church suffered. The prim primitive church had opposition. After all, uh, uh, but God gave, a vic gave victory. What was said? What was said when they, when they mentioned about what the apostles were saying? You need to be careful. Is this work from God? You may be fighting the work of God. So what comes from the Lord will remain. But at the moment, we need to be prepared not to allow our faith to be bombarded because faith is bombarded in your life, inside of you. Because sometimes you see things, you see something. And there's an expression that is used often here. I cannot extend too much. I don't want you to get sleepy here. But look, there is something today that is, is promoted a lot, which is a, a subliminal message. Have you heard about it? It's very interesting. This is a crazy thing. And because this, that thing, Coca-Cola, has a name that is inverted. It's like a... This, this, a lot of craziness there. There's a subliminal message. The enemy does it often. So, like for example, when I, when a person sometimes was in our midst and stopped believing on everything that one day they experienced, and they begin to promote this, what happened to this? There's a message that is being delivered. Sometimes they criti criticize the brother, sister. What is the message? So wearing out of faith. Imagine that person from the church. Look, oh my goodness. That's the message that the enemy sends behind it. They're wearing out of the faith. He's not worried about Ronildo or that you criticize Ronildo or criticize me or somebody else. No, he's not worried about this. Not at all. The intention, the subliminal intention of the enemy is to wear out your faith. And that's why that's why Paul says that we need to be prepared for the trap. I'm sorry, I'm worried too much with trap, with the armor of God. With the, the trap, no. With the armor of God. So when we can erase with the shield of faith, the shield of faith to erase all the 
the inflamed darts of the enemy. The shield of faith to erase all the inflamed arrows of the enemy. And this is something that we need to use, the faith, because faith is connected to grace, grace and the operation of the Holy Spirit. So when you are living the experience of faith, nothing is able to reach you. You overcome everything. You see things you, in you see where the real facts and the reality is because faith is interior. Faith is not exterior. I mentioned I mentioned on the on the last class on the last seminar. But I'm going to tell you only I'm going to say on the seminar. No, no, I'm going to say only on the seminar. My experience my experience in relation to faith. That's why I said in Boston. So I I've always been religious. I already told you that. I was I was I was raised reasoned by by my family and an experience of faith that was very interesting. I'm not gonna tell you here, I'm gonna tell you there. Whoever goes to the seminar will hear about it because there is a topic related to faith. There is a topic related to science that we are going to approach there. I'm going to make a couple of statements that are very important. So now, bringing this message to a close, I'm going to tell the brethren that we're very happy to be here. I believe that the majority will be there in Orlando. I think that the majority will be there. Where's Marcus? Marcus, it's all the way back there. You're going to be there, right, Marcus? He was almost every day with me on the WhatsApp. <laughs> He tells all the secrets from the church. I know everything because of Marcus. He tells me everything. He tells me everything. If you're playing instruments well, if you're not, he tells everything to me. I'm joking. Marcus is a very good guy. Let's stand up and glorify the Lord.
Lord, praise your name. You glorify you for the experience that faith that was given to your people. For the operation of the Holy Spirit in each life, Lord, the awakening, for the feeling, the different feeling of what you do in each heart. Lord, bless each life who came here, operate in a, a special way, and infirmities, deliver your people. In your name we say the wonderful grace of Lord Jesus, the love, great love of God, our eternal Father, and the sweet and tender operation of the Holy Spirit, the comfort may be with each one of you now until the return of Jesus. Amen. Any message? Amen. The seminar starts at noon on Saturday. Tomorrow, Saturday at 6.30 in the morning. Saturday, whoever goes by bus at 6.30 in the morning, we're going to be leaving here, the, the door here in the church, 6.30, not 6.35 or 6.40, not 6.25. So the brand that come, they go by bus, come a little early so we can park your vehicle and put the, your luggage in. First day that they came to college. Everybody knew a teacher was very rigorous. First day of class in the first class, which was anatomy, was a topic for us. Very shocking because you needed to deal with to anatomic parts. So he came, he said something similar to this. He came to us and we were 75 students. He looked to us and said, I want to say to you, to call us sirs is humiliating. So I want to tell you that our class starts at 8. It's 8 o'clock. It means to me 7 and 60 minutes. And he began the class just like this. 8 o'clock means 7 and 60 minutes. So when it was Eight o'clock, he asked to close the door of the class. Nobody would be able to enter. It was a big trial. He's not going to do this. 